Hi and welcome to episode three of The Grilling on Angling Coach TV. I'm very pleased to be joined by an old friend of mine, Paul Garner, Dr. Paul Garner, I should say, no less. Um, a lot of you will recognise Paul from uh, the writing that he does in the Angling Times and his column in there. Thank you very much for joining me, Paul. That's all right, mate. Good to see you again. It's been a and while, you, mate. mate. <laughs> certainly has, certainly has. Well, if we go all the way back to the start, which I, I like to do, we're going to get people on here for yeah. a chat, and um, tell us about how you got into fishing when you were younger. Um, well, you, you didn't have a great deal of choice in our family, really. I mean, my dad fished and my granddad on my mum's side fished, so um, as kids, it was um, me and my brother didn't have a lot of option. We were taken on by mum and dad, and... Uh, went from there really but um, it was funny because say my brother and I were both sort of exposed to it sort of equally as kids and um, eventually he sort of he doesn't fish anymore he went off into computers and that kind of thing and uh, I stuck with the fishing. Excellent yeah. and you then went on to study uh, a doctorate in fish ecology what prompted you to do that? Yeah well um, <laughs> it was all I ever really wanted to do I mean it, it, it's a bit strange really because I'm from Fulham in sort of southwest London and um, you, you know we didn't even have a lot of fresh water around I mean all we had really was the Thames which when, when I was a kid wasn't the cleanest river in the world and um, it, it was just the only thing I, I ever wanted to do really I suppose I progressed from kind of like dinosaurs through sort of wows to then wanting to uh, get into fish and um, yeah, even from sort of school days, um, when I went to see the career master, I told him that I wanted to be an ichthyologist, which is basically someone who studies fish. Mm. Um, and he said, "Give me, let me give you a piece of advice, son. Go and get a job in a bank. Yeah, forget, forget about that. But fortunately, I didn't, and mm. uh, so I stuck at it. And um, yes, uh, the original plan, to be honest, was to go to Sparshol. Um, mm. Back in those days, um, Sparshot was just about the only college um, that was doing sort of fish farming and, and fisheries kind of stuff. Um, and it was so popular, of course, that you had to basically do a year's work experience before um, you could start the course. Mm. And um, I'd sort of not done very well in my A-levels. Uh, I'd applied to a couple of universities um, and was just about, literally just about a couple of days before I was due to go off and start working on a fish farm up on the Upper Kennet. Um, I got um, offered a university place through clearing mm. and so, so I ended up at uni. Excellent. And having a, achieved your degree, your doctorate in fish ecology, how did you then go on to forge a career in the angling industry? Um, it was just a, a load of lucky coincidences really. Um, I mean, I, I did my degree in, in marine and freshwater biology in London. Um, did okay at that and um, then just as I was finishing that there was an opportunity that came up to do a PhD um, which was working on small fish, uh, sort of young of the year coarse fish on the, the River Grey Twos um, and straight after that um, there was a, 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 another postdoctoral fellowship came up um, which was going to be based around some kind of fisheries work. So I applied for that um, to the Freshwater Biological Association and, and managed to get that as well. So um, I didn't have a proper job until I was sort of in my mid twenties really. Um, but by the end of that kind of time, I got married um, and wanted to sort of settle down. And um, it, it was a time when sort of research science, which is what I was doing, was kind of changing in the UK. and. Um, it was becoming much more difficult to get funding. It was, it was a lot more competitive um, tendering, really, um, which didn't really suit what I wanted to do. I was much more sort of um, um, just in it for the for the research, really, rather than mm. you know. And a lot of time, it seemed that people were asking the wrong questions um, rather than the sort of real big fundamental stuff. Um, and. <laughs> Completely by coincidence, I was still fishing, and I, and I won a competition that was running at the time called the the Angling Masters, um, which sort of gave me a bit of sort of prominence um, in the angling press. Mm. I'd started sort of reporting catches of sort of some bigger barbel and stuff I was catching, and off the back of it, got offered a, a job in the industry. So, on a day-to-day -day basis, Paul, what does your job as an angling journalist consist of? Um, it, it's really varied and difficult to pin down, to be honest. Um, 
it might surprise people to know that you, you know I'm, I'm lucky if I get 48 hours a week to fish um, for myself um, the only great thing I mean I'm self-employed and so I can pick and choose what days I work so I tend to have that sort of 48 hour block midweek and when obviously the banks are a bit quieter um, a lot of my fishing big fish fishing is a long way from home I mean it can be all over the country so again I have to try and maximize my time on the bank and, and try and do one bigger session every week or every couple of weeks really because that's all I can get in but work-wise it's um, regular stuff like my, my bait doctor column in angling times every week um, I also write for several other magazines like Improve Your Course Fishing on a regular basis. Um, and I work for companies like Nash. I go out and shoot a lot of magazine features with uh, sponsored anglers, um, get a little bit involved with sort of product development uh, and that kind of thing. Um, real mixed bag really, you know, f through, the, through the course of the year. In the summer I do a little bit of guiding. Um, whatever I can do to pay the rent, to be honest. And what would you say is, uh, what would you say are some of the things that annoy you most about the angling industry the way it is? <laughs> um, nothing really that overly annoys me. I, I tend to be a fairly relaxed, kind of laid-back person these days and uh, I tend to just do my own thing. I, I think the only thing that's sort of a major um, sort of bugbear in fishing is that um, we, we seem to lack a sort of cohesive um, management of our fisheries we've got the angling trust the environment agency often it would seem not working closely enough together to be honest i'd like to see the angling trust take on all of the operations you know revolving around fisheries and all of the rod license money going directly to the angling trust because i think they are you know so much more representative and, and uh, of what anglers are actually wanting to do you know, and they understand better you know, some of the practicalities of modern angling, I think. Mm. And sort of sticking with modern angling, um, obviously you're quite knowledgeable in, in terms of fish behaviour, so what, what are some of the silliest things <laughs> that you've heard anglers say about fish behaviour? Um, not really silly things, but you, you just get some kind of misunderstandings. I mean, things like people say, oh, I've caught all the fish in the peg. Um, whereas, you, you, you know, my understanding of it is that fish move around a lot more. I've done quite a lot of underwater filming and stuff like that. I've got friends who've been heavily involved in radio tracking over the years. Uh, and fish move around a lot, a lot more than you might realise. They can be from one end of the lake to the other, you know, very quickly in you know, minutes. Um, things like that, um, things like noise and vibration on the bank, um, it does make a difference. Um, you know, to, to what you're going to catch if you can keep the noise down, particularly keep the vibration down. Sound doesn't actually travel through the surface of the water very well, but if you stamp your feet or slam a car door, those vibrations are what really travel through the water. So mm. anything sort of stealthy like that that you can do, you, you will catch more fish. Mm. And at the moment obviously we are in a sense struggling to recruit more anglers into the sport what, what do you think the biggest barriers are to that um it's not something i particularly get involved with to be honest but um i think it it's literally comes down to um there being so many other things that, that youngsters uh, and younger people can do these days that um i think that the, the people you know when i was growing up um in central London I mean I, I, I'm actually my cousin and I and my, and my brother were the only th people that I knew that went fishing and you know my dad used to bring along some of my school friends but none of them really took to it they all had other um, you know things that they were into um, and I just see kids these days there's, there's just such a wide range of things that they can get interested in that um, you know why fishing so all we can do I think is make it as easily accessible to as, as many people as possible, young and old, you know, male, female, whoever, and then hopefully some of them will think they'll click with it and they'll think, yeah, this is something I want to pursue and, and get more involved with. Yeah, and I mean, like yourself, some of them may even be lucky enough to, to forge a career like you have done. And part of your career is obviously 
the writing and you, you have got a book out at the moment it's yep. called Scratching the Surface yep. can you tell us a bit about that? <laughs> yeah it, it, it started off just as um, being a bit bored on holiday to be honest um, I'm not the sort of person who can sort of sit, sit around in, you know, in a deck chair soaking up the sun and, you know, when we're away abroad on holiday so I just started taking a laptop with me and um, just um, writing stuff down I mean I, I was 45 a, a couple of weeks ago and already I find myself saying things like, God, it's not like it was when I was young and, oh, you should have, you know, you should have been around 20 years ago and stuff like that. And those sort of memories, I was starting to lose them uh, and they're getting jumbled up. So I started writing them down. And um, before I knew it, I'd written 100,000 words. <laughs> so scratching the surface is, is really um, just the stories of my fishing over the years, the good, the bad. Um, the mistakes I've made, the cock-ups, you know, mm. it, it's pretty warts and all, really. I've not tried to sort of dress it up to sort of massage my own ego. It is what it is. Yeah. Well, it's definitely something I'll, I'll, I'll have to read in the future, a bit of holiday reading. Yeah. I, I think yeah. There. Um, and uh, looking to the future, what have you got lined up in terms of your own personal fishing that you're looking to achieve? Yeah, it's, it's getting really kind of going in two different directions, really. I mean... Um, what really sort of motivates me is, is catching really big fish um, and to be honest it doesn't matter what species it is I mean I, I tend to sort of follow the seasons really so right now I'm sort of just moving from sort of bream fishing into tench um, then it'll be kind of rud and carp through the summer and then back to sort of predator fishing during the winter and yeah uh, to, to to do the travelling, to put the miles in, you know, I've got to be fishing venues where I think, you know, there's something exceptional here. But the trouble is that that just makes the fishing so much harder because you're fishing mm. venues that are generally pretty lo low stocked, and, and that's all that. But, you know, the only reason they're hard is because there's not many fish in them. Mm. Um, so as a sort of a foil, a sort of a counterbalance to that, I, I've kind of got into doing. Um, maybe some sort of more wacky things like um, a bit off the off the wall so um, things like salmon fishing I live near the, the River Severn in the Midlands mm -hmm. which has a good run of salmon so I'm sort of salmon fishing on there and um, floater fishing I love so I do a lot of floater fishing for carp and rudd and stuff during the summer mm -hmm. um, just because it's great fun and, and doing other kind of strange things. I've got some sea fishing trips planned in for this year and, yeah. and just really diverse kind of things, really. But plenty of fishing. Plenty of fishing, that's, that's it, definitely. <laughs> and finally, just to put you on the spot with this one, yeah. um, if you had to fish one venue mm. for the rest of your life, yeah. which one would it be and why? Um, well, that's a good question. I think it, it would be easy to say... Uh, I think my passion is pike fishing, so it, it would be easy to say maybe one of the big reservoirs for pike. But um, I also know that I tend to get bored after a while. Whatever I do, if I do, if I do it for too long, I need a change. So I think that might be a bit, bit one-dimensional. So um, I think I'm going to say the River Thames, mm. um, and simply because it's such a a it's such an unknown and you know through the course of the year you could fish for everything from wild brown trout to salmon to pike to big carp to big chub and barbel it, you, i'd never be short of something to fish for on the thames you know and it's it's a, it's probably the first place i ever fished when i was a kid as well so it would be kind of like a nice you know complete mm. circle really if it was where i ended up yeah yeah so, i definitely know yeah, where you're coming from yeah, there yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of the interview. Uh, thank you very much for you, Paul, uh, for coming along and participating. And uh, look forward to seeing you on another episode of The Grilling sometime soon. Thanks again, Paul. Cheers, Mike. Thanks very much. <laughs>